the Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes as a company is about its customers. As the holiday season has quickly approached, explore a wide selection of unique and practical gifts at the Fire Store's gift center. Find the perfect presents for firefighters, EMTs, and first responders today. The Fire Store's goal is to get you the gear you need when you need it at prices you can afford. Visit thefirestore.com for everything but the truck and shop its family of brands including Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more. Well, welcome to another edition of Fire and Training. I'm your host, Douglas Klein. Joining me is my good friend and, and esteemed co- colleague, Christopher Dom, as we're going to embark on a journey tonight to talk about fire ground operations. Of course, you know, we'll have building construction tied in. We'll have tactics. We're going to talk about the side of our world as we know it as Five Star Command and looking at managing risks and talking about some of the current events that are out there. So, Chris, thanks for being on the show with me. Always a pleasure, Doug. Always a pleasure. You know, it's um, a lot of changes are going on in, in the world of the fire service right now. And uh, there, there's a few things that are that are popping up. And, you know, there's some review. We, we had an incident here just the other day and uh, trying to explain some of the rapid fire growth phenomenon is even using the science that we know, using some of the research that has been out there for a number of years now, but as continued by UL and, and ISFSI and many of the groups, um, we're still seeing things that uh, sometimes, you know, catch us off guard or shock us a little bit. It's a little bit about what we're going to talk about. And I know you're involved with with NOSH and, and some of the um, after action reviews that they do. But I want to tie a lot of things back together when it comes to tactics and, and being able to read the building, read the smoke, understand, you know, your resources being able to tie in what risk management really is all about based upon your personnel. And of course it comes back, you know, to what we talk about, you know, the company, the compartment and the building a lot. So you ready to kick this one off and and tear it apart for about the next hour. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, you know, the biggest thing that I'm seeing and and I've heard this and there's been a couple of reports that have popped up here recently and, and some things on social media about rapid fire phenomenon that it's taking off and we're seeing exponential fire growth to a degree that we've not seen or is somewhat unexplainable. Um, what are you seeing about that, Chris? And what do you know that's going on out there? Well, I, I think what we're continuing to experience, <clears throat> whether you call it, uh, you know, extreme fire behavior, uh, rapid fire growth, uh, we all have, I think, come to the conclusion and have agreement that fire conditions and the fire dynamics within the compartment of our buildings, the types of fires that we are now consistently being confronted with um, certainly are not what they were back 20 years ago and certainly not reflected of what we experienced back in the 90s, let alone the 80s. But even in the late 70s, early 1980s, we were experiencing some dramatic changes within the compartment setting of our structural fire conditions as we are today. And some of those changes in that 1980 period, as they relate today, uh, relate back to the fire load package, the contents, whether it be the contents of that structure and occupancy or the contents of the building were dramatically changing which resulted in dramatically different types of fire environments. So um, I think the consensus um, and the pulse currently is that we're finally getting it. I don't believe that many uh, within the fire service 12, 13 years ago, let's go back to maybe the mid 2000, 2005, six, seven timeframe when both uh, uh, NIST and UL were just coming out with the initial studies talking about uh, the changing fire environment, the modern fire environment, and the dramatic uh, images that just showed the escalating time frame in which a flashover would be occurring in a much more rapid stat point. Uh, I think the point was being made 
there were a lot of uh, disbelievers out there because, again, they they only knew what they were experiencing day in and day out. And for many that were just getting into the job, they only know what they know based upon what they were experiencing. So there wasn't any measurement to uh, identify what that uh, delta difference was from a different time frame. So fast forward now here to 2023, uh, I think we have the consensus. We do recognize that the fire load package, the conditions within the compartment, the conditions within the structural fires are different. And we are fortunately enough making strides to address those issues in a positive manner. So there's some good momentum going forward. But, you know, again, I think when we talk about what what we were talking about, even, you know, when I dug, you know, back uh, uh, 2005, 2006 era with some of our program uh, offerings and uh, national deliveries, even programs at FDIC that we were presenting, uh, we were bringing forward some new insights but there were a lot of naysayers, and uh, I think that that is the dramatic shift. We're now we're in that mode of, all right, we get it. Fire environment is what it is. Now let's fine tune. Let's take a look at all of the other aspects that relate back to technique and tactics and operation, tactical windows. I mean, there's just a whole variety of things that we are now addressing in a positive manner to uh, make the job safer and more effective. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, Chris. One of the things that um, kind of sticks in my mind is we're seeing fires go from very, very small fires, what we would even consider incipient stage fires, uh, to where they're blowing up in about 10 seconds, 15 seconds tops, to, to where you've got a heavy amount of uh, rollover, a heavy amount of fire conditions within the room, uh, going from basically what we would call a, a laminar, very lackadaisical smoke flow to having, you know, a heavy volume of turbulent black smoke that is starting to present itself. We know that uh, as fire progresses and we look at the thermal pain and, and the line of demarcation in the room, we get down to about 50%, you know, on a door opening, you know, we're in intimate flashover conditions and that's reaching it much, much faster than we've ever seen it before. And, and I actually went back and reviewed some of the studies and some of the videos that came out of Spartanburg and, you know, looking at the conditions and, you know, with, with, you know, the fire conditions, with the types of furniture, matching it up to, you know, situations that we've had and, you know, reading the, the things that are coming out on, on social media that people are talking about, um, you know, the reports that have come out and how fast the fire progressed. And what they're describing is different even than what we saw back in those studies. So one of the things I know that uh, you were very instrumental in, in getting started and, and we, you know, have worked with and put together and talked about several times is that five-star command. And part of what it goes back to is uh, the building construction itself, taking a look at, you know, your humanistic component, you know, how do you manage those? How do you manage the risk? How do you manage the safety? How do you manage that human performance that goes there? And, you know, in that, with the risk, you can tie in all the stuff with fire behavior. You can take the building construction. You can tie, tie in fire behavior to that. It's almost like we need the six star, which is the changing dynamics of, of fire dynamics that are inside the buildings that we're seeing. But I want to go go to that. And one of the biggest things that I think we need to look at and, and talk about first is the humanistic performance that goes with that, how we take human performance and then we tie it into the risk management component. Part of what we're seeing and we hear this and you, you hear this as well as I do is we're presenting programs, you know, across the United States and in seminars and in discussions with other, you know, firefighters and fire officers is that the amount of fires that people are going to today are not like it was back in what we would call the, the war years by far. And even from the 80s to the 90s to what we're seeing now is, is a far less amount of structures that we respond to that are quote unquote working fires. It used to be we got to them when we had single room and contents. Now we got multiple rooms off. Uh, we talked about the benchmarking with uh, one of our guests one time that were on the show. 
uh, with Billy Dillon, Chief Billy Dillon, uh, over around Florence in South Carolina about starting to benchmark from the time that you're dispatched versus from the time that you're on the scene based upon how the building performs itself. But <clears throat> let's tie into what we've seen. And over the last, I guess, month, I saw four of the folks that I kind of came through the the realm with of a fire service career is, is leaving. So what are we leaving for experience? How much do they have to actually re- rely back on? I think that's somewhere we need to s- pick up and start talking about. Well, you know, it, it, it's a constant ebb and flow. You know, it, it's nothing new to the job, but I, I think that we are going through another cycle of establishing another baseline of candidates that are coming out of recruit school that are now entering the job, those that are entering in the um, early stages of, of company officership. In other words, we have emerging leadership that are transitioning out of the firefighter rank into the company officer rank. And so there's a lot of dynamics as the fire service has always experienced. I think we we had a, a very stable period in a different era of time. However, currently, either through a variety of different as- aspects of either attrition, uh, retirements, which constantly come and go, um, there's also disillusionment. We have individuals who just recognize this job is not for them. Uh, the departments have invested heavily to get them through their training, get them into the company, start developing that experience to become part of a um, efficient company or station. Um, and then again, we end up losing them. So the transitions continue to, to impact us. I truly believe that in looking at that human performance component, however long or short of a period of time that we have that individual, Again, it's very, very important that we develop very clearly delineated and defined company expectations in terms of performance, human performance, and that really is built upon significant aspects of discipline and significant aspects of of individual performance. And that individual performance ends up relating back to accountability. Um, but it's a very challenging aspect, you know, where we're, we're looking at unit effectiveness, company effectiveness, and it all ends up going back to that individual person that's part of a team, that's part of a company, however large or small that may be, whether it be a two, three, or four, four or five person staff company. But it's so, so critical that that uh, company has cohesiveness has the ability to perform from a human performance standpoint and is able to conduct themselves at the most highest level of proficiency and efficiency, specifically, as you just talked about, because of the demand to get engaged very quickly with a high degree of performance um, in in as little as time as possible, because we just don't have that latitude. We we just don't have the ability to to arrive on scene and you know, sort of try to figure it all out. We've got to be able to process, identify what the uh, conditions are, whether it be, you know, something that's based on, on factual or presumed conditions, but we got to go to work. And, and you've got to do it not by just stretching the line and going in. It's, it's really part of a methodology and a process and, and a model that relies on knowledge and skill sets and, and human performance. So I truly believe, Doug, as we have talked about, extensively on the road that the human performance part is a much neglected area, but it has the most significant potential impact as we move forward. And, and again, some colleagues of ours are, are, are doing some cool things. Um, I think when you take a look at, uh, I don't know, Rich Gassaway for one, that, that has promoted a, a number of these aspects that fall under human performance. We talk about situational awareness and some other elements there. And uh, we have some other individuals that are starting to rediscover some some older models when we talk about uh, some of the uh, Oda Loop, uh, talking about some things that, you know, were discussed many, many years ago. They are rediscovering some of these old concepts and are applying them and putting uh, a different perspective on it. Not that it's new, but it's new to the current generation. So everyone is striving individually to try to identify 
how to make the, the system work more effectively and efficiently in a, in a fire ground environment that has little to no um, margin for error. And again, you know, we've talked about this in, the, in our other podcasts and episodes where, you know, that, that margin for error today is razor thin and we just don't have the latitude to mess up and be able to recover. Unfortunately, that recovery may not lead to something positive. It may unfortunately lead to something adverse, whether it be a near miss, whether it be a line of duty death or significant injury uh, or such. So, um, or something that relates not from an injury standpoint, but something that relates back to a uh, unsuccessful uh, mitigation of the incident. In other words, the incident continues to grow. We, we lose more of the building. We lose more of the property. The level of devastation, property loss may be much more significant in terms of dollar uh, loss and so forth, along with the, you know, the life safety components and so forth. So a lot of moving pieces to it. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's there's a lot to be said about the human performance part of it. And, and part of human performance goes back to what you were alluding to all along the way is is tactical perspectives and how we're doing that. Uh, recently, and as in this week, the city of Baltimore put out a memo of, you know, tactical considerations. And of course, there has been from one end of the spectrum to the other in the social media world of, of talking about, you know, their opinions, you know, and what, what people think of that. I definitely don't want to get into a debate one way or the other, but, you know, they're, they're taking into consideration a lot of things from, from a command level staff of, of risk management and safety and those type of components. And uh, again, I go back to thinking as a company officer back in the day is you had to depend on, you know, who you had with you. And we, we alluded to that. And some, some of the changes that we're going through is the, uh, the amount of experience they have is, is limited. Um, one of the ones that really gets me, and, and, and I've noticed this more and more as I've traveled around over the last year, uh, I've seen a lot of places that are putting the tick marks back on the board about, you know, the n- number of feet of hose that they've laid, the length of ladders, and then structure fires. So I, I got in a conversation recently, and I, I don't know if I unsettled them or what, but you could tell it just kind of agitating them a little bit when I said, you know, you, you've marked up here that, you know, over the year you, you've responded to 15 structure fires. I said, if we describe those structure fires and I'll, I'll use, you know, it was somewhat of a suburban rural type community. I said, how many of those are bigger than single wides, double wides, you know, 1800 square foot or less structures that you went to? And the answer I got back was the majority of them. So, but we've got all this experience fighting fires. Well, you do have experience fighting fires in one particular style or size of structure. And if you look at your jurisdictions and we look at the diversity that we've talked about uh, in, in jurisdictions from the types of buildings, the size of the buildings, the compartmentalization, you know, the hazards that are associated with with the type of occupancies that are in there. What level of experience have you really developed? Or are we repeating basically the same call over and over and over and, and getting a false sense of security in the humanistic side, but also in the risk management and the safety side from an officer perspective or a command perspective? Uh, I think we got to look at that. And one of the, the things that I do frequently is I'll ask how many people have been in a commercial structure, 150 to 200 feet deep on a two and a half inch hose line engaged in, in offensive interior tactics. And rarely do I get more than maybe one hand that goes up. But they talk about the number of fires they went to. And I think that's something we we've, we've really got to get back into uh, when, when we're talking about some of our decision making and especially with tactics and deployment and and what we're doing. And, and I haven't heard us talk about this in a while, Chris, but that tactical entertainment concept that we 
we spoke of and in fact was in many of our programs and and I still throw it out today on the road. I know we've we've had conversations about it. I think people get a little complacent at times about being interior to a building and what could happen, how fast it could happen, you know, how well do they really are are in the predictive analytic mode of what's going to happen next. How's the building going to perform? How's the contents going to react? What's the safety side? What's the risk side? And of course, uh, Gordon Graham would say, if it's predictable, it's preventable. And that's part of where I talked about, you know, initially is how do we get into how we read some of these things and make decisions? So let's let's go down that road a little bit. Well, I, I think one of the challenges from the fire service standpoint currently continues to be embracing a more adaptive fireground management approach to the consistencies of the day in and day out responses. In other words, if my first two area has a certain type of buildings and occupancies, construction, and historically our, our both our training as well as our fire ground duties and activities have always been deployed and conducted in a certain consistent manner um, that has been repeated over and over again over decades of time. When we are confronted with either the subtleties of changes or differences in the uh, in the structures, in the occupancies, the conditions, the age, deterioration, the clientele, there's a variety of different variables there. But when we're confronted with a situation in which the rules of engagement are off, our, our deployment of tactics, our tactical windows, our expectations on what the building should be doing as well as the fire should be doing while we are engaged sometimes aren't matching matching up. And that becomes the, the major point of contention when, when there are deltas of differences for whatever reasons and the companies as well as command are not able to recognize those either dramatic or subtle changes during the conduct of operations within that tactical window Unfortunately, when they are when the resulting conditions become very dramatic and dynamic, in other words, there's a flashover, there's a backdraft, there's a partial or um, comprehensive collapse. But especially in light of fire dynamics, the, the the rapidly changing conditions in the common types of structures that we have all developed our skill sets on or are continuing to develop that skill set on when we are confronted with rapidly changing conditions that aren't being identified, in other words, they are not being read and not being comp uh, comprehended, um, or they're looking and seeing and hearing, but they're not understanding and not making a connection. Um, unfortunately, the resulting changes are confronting the companies in a way that are leading to some very adverse events. And unfortunately, again, whether we talk about certain, whether we talk about residential or multiple occupancies, whether we talk about potential vacant uh, abandoned structures, whether we talk about row houses, commercials, what have you, we are arriving on scene, we are deploying and engaging in those activities and in that fire conditions, expecting certain things to be happening in a certain progression. And when they don't, and we're not picking up upon some things that should have been processed in either in the 360, the 180, the initial size up by the first due, uh, the command size up upon the arrival and the assumption of command by the battalion chief or the higher ranking incident commander when there is that transfer. At, at some point, again, there, there are performance conditions that are very predictable that unfortunately are being either misread or are not being read and comprehended and we continue to go down the path of tactical engagement. And unfortunately, we either are lucky and we put the fire out, we make the grabs, we do what we do, or the conditions um, are such that they overwhelm us, meaning the company, um, or they change so dramatically that the companies and personnel that are engaged within the interior or around the uh, surrounding portions of the building are not able to adjust and change uh, physically adjust or change due to those conditions. And then unfortunately, it's 
you know, there, there's an adverse event for, for better words to it. So we've got to get better in reading the fire ground, reading the building, reading the compartment, and reading the company. So that, that fourth piece, Doug, ties back into our conversation on human performance. So, you know, there, there are four reads relative to today's dynamic fire ground as we continue to advocate and to um, tie into our modeling and so forth. And that is, again, reading the fire ground, reading the building, reading the compartment, which is inclusive of reading the fire, reading the smoke, reading those conditions relative to the compartment. And then uh, the fourth piece is reading the companies. And by reading the companies, we talk about engagement. Do we have the right people that are, are being assigned and are conducting themselves? Is there opportunities for changes based upon, let's say, mutual aid companies that are coming in? So let's say we're in a rural or suburban setting and I've got uh, volunteer staff companies coming in and I've got mutual aid company companies coming in on the initial alarm or greater alarm uh, uh, situation. Does the incident commander evaluate the uh, individuals, meaning do they evaluate the company when we know that there's going to be inconsistencies in the company. If we've got consistencies, it's it's a done deal. We don't even have to consider it, but it's not that way. We typically will have a company that arrives. It's staffed with some number of individuals that may or may not have consistencies in terms of their skill set, knowledge, abilities, both physical, mental, and so forth. Now that variable from a human performance standpoint becomes a variable that has to be tied into the uh engagement and modeling of what's occurring. In other words, I've got to take that resource and tie that into what we are currently doing, meaning the home department, meaning the the uh, companies that are currently engaged. So if I have consistencies with a home department, does that variable from a human performance standpoint of the other mutual aid companies, is it an asset or is it a liability? And if it's a liability, do I change the predictability of what's going to occur? by reassigning them, holding them, holding them at staging, uh, because that vulnerability may be something that may not lead to a positive uh, condition. So in, in simple terms, it, it may be the wrong company that shows up. And, and, and again, it's uh, do I have a bunch of old timers? And again, I, I don't say that with, with any sense of disrespect, but you know, we, we have what we have. Do I have a bunch of younger members who have limited uh, experience, uh, um, or is there a combination of a couple of younger uh, firefighters that have experience or are developing this experience, have a baseline set of knowledge and skill sets that can, you know, be an asset to it? But again, uh, do I have some vulnerabilities based upon some um, more older members that may not be able to perform at the same capacity? So that mixture becomes a particular characteristic that affects human performance that affects uh, the overall operation. So um, there's no simple piece of it all, but I would venture to say that that's, that's an, another piece that we need to be having some rather robust conversations and dialogue and debate, whether it be in the classroom, at the conference setting, nationally or regionally, to talk about uh, what happens when I've got the wrong companies arriving on scene. And, and, it, and it go, and again, even it's, it's, it's the career guys showing up, right? As a battalion chief, you're expecting a certain um, balance of companies coming in on that on that particular uh, alarm. And now let's say you've got a covering a lieutenant or a covering uh, officer riding uh, right front. Um, or let's say the the second do that should have been arriving is now the um, is now a mutual aid piece or it's the fourth due that's arriving second due because the second due is out on another alarm. So the composition of what normally is going to be first, second, third arriving within the confines of that district or battalion, maybe there's a dynamic of something different that now creates a variable that may affect the incident commander's uh, decision-making process and uh, may lead to error likely traps or on a positive note, Everything is well and good. We just go to work because we've got the right elements. But things are very predictable if we are looking beyond the obvious sometimes. And I want to jump back to what you were saying, which is a critical part of the command management level, and that is the supervisory oversight. And I, I know myself, I've, I've been on scenes and I have looked past the, 
the one number one company standing there, the number two company went down to number three or number four, ran them around them because of their abilities or their capabilities, the, the company itself. But when I get people inside or I get people engaged in, you know, some type of tactical operation, you know, what is the supervisory oversight doing? What are they watching? Are they are they knowledgeable? And I think that's part of what we have to really begin looking at again. And I'm going to go back into the 80s uh, with uh, ISFSI when they had the company officer programs that, that existed there. And, you know, the management of people, the supervisory components of people and and then the tactical pieces that they were putting together. And, and basically about a two week long company officer program uh, that was very, very robust. And I think what we we've got to do is begin looking at that, and and I think that's that's what we've done. We, we've gotten to where we establish some minimum standards, and we're we're hung up on the minimum is okay. And I think that's in our model that we talk about in in this this command style module that we're looking at five components. That that command module is so so important in, in that piece. It looks at everything and even for, and everybody says, oh, well, you're talking about the incident commander. No, I'm not. I'm talking pretty much about the company officer that's inside or the acting company officer that's with a crew and what they're, you know, overseeing what they're doing, evaluating the safety that's going on, evaluating the tactics, evaluating, like you said, you know, the, those components that you laid out there about the compartment, the company, you know, the, the building itself you know, reading the conditions, all those things need to be going on that, you know, I watch on a, on a regular frequent basis, you know, across the United States and, and even looking at some of the, the videos that you see, you know, on the YouTubes and social medias and the reels and everything that show up. And it's like, were you even doing any of the things that we're talking about here? And it's like, well, you know, my wife gets tickled at me, you know, I'll, I'll be in the evenings, you know, you know, doing my wind down type time and, and, and watching, you know, social media and going, what are you thinking? Why are you doing that? Don't you see this? And she says, like, she looks at me, she goes, remember, they can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> the problem of it is we want them to hear what we're talking about. We want them to understand and it's a good example of is a Steve Marsall from uh, FDMY talking about occupancy, pr- survivability and occupancy profiling, you know, taking those two and, and really working through it. He does a phenomenal job of getting people to think. And it, it's not everybody says, oh, he's just trying to create a culture where you don't go search. No, he's trying to create a culture that you understand if there is someone there, is it survivable? Is it not survivable? Is it, you know, capable for you to be in there to operate? What's your time frames of operation? What's the survivability component of that? Really being able to nail down that one small component in a conglomerate of, of other tactical pieces that are coming together for, for the scene mitigation. And people just get lost on that. And well, I, I, I don't disagree on the search culture. I think that's one of the pillars in the fire service. We have to search, but sometimes searching is is not until the fire is extinguished, because there's there's nothing to search that is conducive for you to be in there at times. Again, we we have to apply the right model, the right process, the right tactical engagement that's appropriate for the building, the footprint, the square footages, the occupancy, the occupancy risk, the construction, the degree of resources that are available, the resources coming in. And again, that is part of the challenge is that we are not utilizing critical thinking. We are, and again, look, and I get it. We, we get the thing that you've got to arrive. You've got to get, be very prompt and very aggressive in today's environment, but you got to be thinking. And whether you like it or not, whether you agree or disagree with some of the concepts, whether it be survivability profiling, whether you talk about slicers, dicers, or nicers, whether you talk about anything that is out there in the current realm that is pushing buttons, that is, that is challenging the, the paradigm that for many, 
you know, that you got just got on the job in, in the last three or four or five years. You know, I mean, somebody programmed you to think a certain way. You just did not come out of nowhere, meaning on the, you know, the public side, get into the private side, meaning in the, into the job and into the fire service without some preconceived notions or coming out of recruit school, coming on the job, going into the house, being either reconditioned or further conditioned to think a certain way. The challenge continues to be, I think, that when we talk about predictability performance, that if I'm showing up and I've got a 1,000 or 1,200 square foot bungalow or Cape Cod, and my next alarm is going to be a 15 or 20,000 square foot mega mansion, and at some other point, I've got a uh, you know 25 or 3,000 square foot older commercial taxpayer, or I'm showing up and I've got a 20,000 square foot uh, hybrid uh, commercial building. They, they all have one thing in common. They are buildings, their occupancies, and especially if they are on fire, that is the common denominator. Everything else are variables that are going to have different considerations, either dramatic or subtle, that's going to be defined by what the first due company officer does or doesn't do, what the arriving battalion or district chief initiates, how that incident is, is commanded, controlled, the engagement at the tactical level, the command decision making, the tactical windows, and performance, the performance of the companies in terms of what kind of lines, how deep are we going, do we think we can go interior versus maybe going in some other alternate entry point or utilizing a variety of different approaches that are appropriate for the given situation. Unfortunately, it's no longer textbook rules of engagement uh, firefighting that everything had been based upon going back in the 90s and, and, and even before or certainly from the 90s going forward. Um, it goes back to your, your conversation and your, your points in the beginning of the, sh of the program about fire dynamics in today's realm are unique and continuing to challenge our arriving companies. And if we understand a couple of things regarding the building, the occupancy, our company's capabilities or limitations, the plus or the negative, and we are much more adaptive, utilizing some critical thinking in terms of what we're going to do, how we're gonna do it, and more importantly, when we're gonna do it. What's the sequencing? Because that goes back to fundamentals that were introduced again about 15 years ago about the phasing and tactical approaches. We no longer are in a linear mode of operations where we arrive and we have concurrent activities uh, being uh, conducted. We very well may have to have sequential and or termination points. So certain activity commences or, or stops for a period while certain other things occur, or there's gonna be certain activities that have to occur in a certain sequence of time, sometimes collectively, sometimes independently, based upon fire dynamics, vent path, flow paths, variety of other factors, the resources, gallon per minute flow rates, I mean, all of these other pieces, but the guys typically end up showing up. First do second, do third do, we stretch this line, we stretch that line, companies go to work, support activities, what have, have you, and when the fire dynamics become challenging at best or because again, what's occurring within that compartment and those fire conditions or within the building, um, we're either a successful, fire goes out, rescues are made, we go back, we go home, um, or something bad ends up happening. And that's where we're seeing things, Doug. And I think we're we're seeing more and more adverse events. Uh, we're, we're seeing some of the most recent line of duty deaths and near misses that are being captured. They're being talked about, discussed. Some are taking prop actions, others, Maybe not so much, and again, we'll just leave it at that. But uh, we've we've got to be we've got to be understanding some things that are occurring nationally, and identify what it is that we can bring forward at the local or regional level that's applicable, and ask the questions: Can this happen to us? Can can we have a similar event that occurred wherever it may be occurring across the United States or across the the county? Uh, or across that state, can we have a similar occurrence? And if the answer is yes, the question is, well, what are the gaps? What is it that we need to do with a degree of promptness to minimize or curtail or eliminate the same event from occurring? And that's part of the challenge. We're just not getting it. And it goes back to the NIOSH reports, the near-miss event reports, uh, 
everything that we talk about, we're just, you know, we're, we're just, we're, we're seeing these history repeating events occurring with some degree of frequency that um, is challenging lessons and learnings and, and repeatability. So, and I think that does fall down to the safety management side, Chris. And, and we, you know, one of the, the components in that is about your competencies, your skills, how do your policies and procedures fall into there? You know, what, what are your typical work practices? You know, what do you have? And one of the things that I get back to is, you know, we, we can have great skills. We can cut roofs. We, we can force doors. And, but how do you put all that together? What do we have that puts it all together? And if we're not running a, a lot of these responses, how do we gain that experience? How do, how do we teach this next generation um, the information that needs to be there? And one of it is we are repeating our history over and over and over again. And especially if you go look at the NAS reports, we're, we're seeing a lot of the same things occurring over and over and over again, the same mistakes, the same issues. And, and we keep pointing those out. And I mean, we've done that for a number of years now. So I think part of what we've got to do is is change our philosophy in how we're getting people competent. Uh, one of the things I know is from a training world, from a professional development world, I cannot create all those situations on a training facility grounds for the most part. Even in the most elaborate burn facility, I do not have the capabilities of, of creating those. So how do you get those? Uh, one of the things that is, is being regenerated, and, and actually people are really beginning to embrace this again as they did a few years ago, is, is with the simulations and being able to create virtual um, abilities to teach and to learn and to be able to get them to think through some of these situations and processes that we're not exposing them to, and we don't have the ability to. And, you know, as Gordon says, you know, the first time you do something like selling down the coast and, and his son, as, as he points out, says, dad, isn't that one of those high risk, low frequency events? Very good, son. I love it when he does that. And, and that's in several of his uh, videos that are in the national fire Academy classes and all, but, I don't know how much, and, and this goes, I, I saw just this past week was the anniversary of Don Abbott, uh, his passing, hmm. and, you know, Abbottville and how we created simulations in the old days of, and, and we even did this, Chris, I mean, all the, you know, setting up the buildings and, and yeah. using the matchbox cars and, and, you know, the train sets and all this type of stuff that we used to try to create back in the day before we had technology like we have today but, and i think that that's one of the pieces that we can go to for the safety management side to help us with our competencies uh of knowledge anyway it, it doesn't, because it I, doesn't I, have to be that it doesn't have to be this big you know computer-based activity you know let's go back to some fundamentals let's, let's do some curbside conversations getting out in the streets and, and walking around the buildings getting into the structures you know, sitting at the kitchen table, um, taking out a pad of paper uh, or, or taking a Google map image that's, you know, everybody can access and look at on their smartphones and talking about some things, sketching some things on the whiteboard and uh, what have you. I mean, it doesn't take much to develop insights and develop the conditioning that one needs to prepare themselves, meaning the individuals and the companies for what might come about. So, yeah, it's well and good, especially on the training side, to get into the formality, but it rests back to, I, I, I always say, it rests back to the company officer to develop what's necessary regarding the skill set level, but it's it's part of that conditioning, conditioning the mind, conditioning so that when they do arrive on scene at that taxpayer, that mega mansion, that bungalow, uh, that new commercial hybrid that they are thinking some things through, especially it's in the, if, they're, if it's in their first due. No one should be surprised at anything. I mean, it, it is, is a, it's a dereliction of duty, in my opinion, if someone is arriving on scene 
and doesn't have some degree of insights of that building in their first due um, regarding construction, regarding square footages, and, and other critical elements on the size up that are going to play out in the, uh, the engagement part as they're stretching the line, as they're entering the building, as they're conducting whatever the priorities may be. It, it's, it's, it is no longer acceptable to have that, that, uh, that unknown. And I think in the simplicity of a very complex world that we live in, let's go back to some basics. I mean, again, I, I always challenge my guys when we're, when we're lecturing uh, the classes and and I'll ask the guys, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night or it's, it's midnight and some guys are sleeping. Some guys are watching TV. They're they're having coffee. They're, they're doing whatever they're doing. They're siloed out and in quarters on the career side. When was the last time you as a company officer took that that company out at, you know, at midnight or one o'clock in the morning to look at something under the cloak of darkness that that's different under the daytime hours and um, uh, or on a Saturday or. You know, the guys that uh, on the volunteer side, why is it that you're not doing some of these things either on a personal level or on a formal or informal basis to learn about your built environment and prepare yourselves for those conditions? So um, I I always hear the excuses. And again, Abbottville, you know, working the desktop, uh, the models and so forth is a great thing. Sometimes uh, I think the simplest thing is, you know, do a quick uh, photocopy. Of, of a Google map of, of a particular building you've got and it's two-dimensional you can you can copy it three-dimensionally with some of the uh, um, formatting and so forth and and sketch and talk about heights talk about some things if there's an unknown get back out in the physical environment and, and walk it look at it and figure some things out but uh, we, we've got to condition ourselves for those potential responses in the absence of the formal in-service training that Typically, the training divisions do not have enough time to conduct them or the frequency to conduct them. This is something that should be done, you know, a 15, 20 minute or 30 minute window every time the guys are coming on shift, every time somebody's coming into the station, either on the career volunteer side, having some conversations about their main street, about whatever that building may be and and preparing, preparing themselves mentally to execute the mission in the least amount of time when time is such a critical uh, resource and component. Well, I'm, I'm going to jump over and I'm going to add on to that from, from a perspective of uh, what you can do and what needs to be done uh, in a department. And not only just for the ISO components that go with it, but from, for the safety side, for the knowledge side is uh, we have pre-plans and if you're out, and you're in the streets and you're looking at buildings, you're talking about tactics, what are you really doing? You're doing pre-incident surveys, you're doing pre-incident planning, you're doing strategies and tactics. All that is training. All that can be logged as training. And you're you're accomplishing much, much more by being out there. You're, you're killing basically two, three birds with one stone, so to speak. But again, it's, it's like you said, and, and I'm glad you went down that path, Chris, because I was going to circle back around to it. It was um, when was the last time that you surveyed your district? When was the last time you really looked at your district? Uh, you're out in it. You're running calls in it. What are you talking about on your way back? Where are you stopping? You know, what are, what are the concerns you're saying? Hey, this is an issue. Look at this. One of the best times to see what's really going on is is when you're out and they're building things. And in my world, they're building things every you know five feet that you can move. I mean, that's the stuff that people need to be looking Slow at. Slow down. I mean, take take advantage totally take advantage of it. You know, but the guys want to get back to quarters. They they're getting ready to take that next alarm, and so it now goes back to get the guys together in off hours. Do it during some down off time when you're not on shift. Um, on the volunteer side, nighttime weekends. You've got to be doing it formally or informally, and you've got to get into the alleyways. Uh, you know, the, the old adage goes, if you see the, the sign that says coming soon or you see the dumpster out front or in the back, it's always an opportune time because some things are d- d- dynamically occurring within the building that are going to afford you some opportunities that it's going to help you to pre-plan, precondition what you may very well be confronted with at some point down the road, uh, maybe in your career, maybe not. But inevitably, with your first due, there's a lot of things that are occurring, or there, here's the other challenge, though. There, there may be some 
um, very um, static and stable kind of uh, activities where there is no activity. In other words, you've, you've got a very stable environment. There's very little change occurring. Um, it does not negate the need to still take a look at Main Street, take a look at the alleyways. Buildings age. There's deterioration. There's other things that are occurring that may change the manner in which you are going to uh, conduct yourself uh, during the course of operations. So it doesn't necessarily mean that when there's all these dramatic and dynamic things occurring relative to new construction change, sometimes it's just the static day-to-day -day kinds of things that do require some periodic, hey, I'm going to go up on this roof, I'm going to take a look at the exposure, I'm going to go in the alleyway, I'm going to do a 360 of this building, um, I want to take a look at this this residential structure that we haven't visited in a while because it's fairly large, and, and ask permission from the homeowner and just conduct an informal 360 and take a look at, you know, reading the, the fire ground, reading the landscaping and the change in terrain and how will the snow uh, accumulation affect that or how will the rain accumulation. So, you know, environmental factors are going to change depending upon the seasonal conditions that you might be encountering that either help or, again, challenge the operation. So there's a lot to it. And it ultimately goes back to sizing up but I think, as, as you talked about, Doug, it goes back to fundamentals. We've got to develop the skill set level. We've got to have an appreciation for the things that are changing within our, our first dues, our, our built environments, and we've got to condition. And that conditioning goes back to human performance, training, whether it be formally at the divisional level, meaning training academy, in service, uh, or what have you, and the stuff that can be done um, on shift, in quarters, by – even just the firefighters. It doesn't necessarily have to be the officers. So, you know, for, for our younger firefighters that don't have rank, um, there's nothing to say that you can't be doing this on your own either. And then share it with command, share that, and uh, hopefully they're going to embrace it and acknowledge the fact that you're doing some good things. Uh, for those of you that are encountering some less than open arms because you're stepping on someone's uh, uh, toes or encroaching upon their particular area of operation and have and what have you um, just understand the dynamics of how things are and but again you cannot uh, diminish the value of what you're you guys are doing whether it be a small group doing your own little walking tours doing some tabletops uh, discussing these elements hopefully you've got good engagement by company and command officers and leadership that are, are doing this as as part of a larger group and it's but again, do it at the least smallest level and work its way up to uh, to others and don't neglect the mutual aid departments either. Sometimes invite some guys and gals over from mutual aid departments and sit down and tabletop some things and talk about some items, order a couple of pizzas and so forth. And guess what? You end up conditioning and preparing and, and, and walking away with some uh, potential uh, opportunities to do something a little bit better. Uh, with that level of shared knowledge that everybody has uh, contributed in that that particular time frame. Well, Chris, we've covered a ton of information tonight uh, with our listeners, and always exciting to to get and have conversation. Uh, I was thinking, you were talking about getting out in the streets and and looking at things. Uh, I know we did that in Oklahoma City uh, when we were out yeah, there and yeah. just walking around and, and having, you know, discussion about the types of building construction, some of the unique facets that were associated to it, some of the architectural designs and the challenges that that could present in, in operations. And I think that's the, the avenues that people are going to have to go down. And, you know, quite frankly, it's fun to be out. You can enjoy yourself and, uh, you get to learn a lot about your districts and, and makes it to, to where you can make better decisions in looking at this. And, you know, part of why, why I wanted to bring this out as we're coming to an end of the show here is I see a lot of changes that are going on from, you know, the people that are exiting the fire service uh, to the changes in the environments that we're in. Uh, the fastness of how buildings are going together, the types of materials that we've talked about, you know, at nauseum for a, a long period of time. Um, the different types of buildings, we, we've run series on those. We continue to talk about those because I think that's that's some of the key fundamentals that come back to 
those competencies and, and truly knowing that that's I mean, it comes down to basically what I say in every class that we've done, especially when we talk tactics, is you got to know your battleground and you got to know your enemy. And fire and the behavior of fire is your enemy. Your battleground are the buildings and the environment that you're going to be in. And you really got to know those and you got to spend some time uh, just like what the military does to prepare for that. And that's that's what you're you're having to do out on the streets and. I think that's super, super important yeah. for our folks yeah. to know. And again, you know, taking a look at what we've talked about tonight, we, we actually went above and beyond what I, I was <laughs> looking to cover with the five star command, yeah. attaching it to these, these pieces. We covered all five areas actually, uh, mm-hmm. and, and not super, super in depth, but we touched on all five areas of five star command in, in that model from humanistic risk management to building construction to uh, safety management to command management to to all those things that we need to be thinking about tactically. So some of your parting and closing thoughts, Chris. Um, I, I think when we just, uh, again, I, I think the theme of our conversation here on this episode revolved around how do we evaluate, how do we size up, how do we look at some of the conditions. Ultimately, uh, much of what we can or don't do on the fire ground is going to rest with the individual, the team, and the company. So I I think the opportunity is to take a look at yourself at the personal level. Are you prepared? Are you knowledgeable? What are your gaps? Um, And and just let's focus in on the aspects of sizing up uh, the fire ground, sizing up the conditions that you're encountering, uh, whether you are arriving on an engine, whether you're arriving on a ladder company or truck company or, or other apparatus uh, and whatever that sequence may be, um, take the opportunity to see what kind of size up and evaluation criteria you're currently using as part of your SOP. What's your process? What's your methodology? Uh, what, what are the expectations at the company level? What are the expectations at the command level? And, uh, and then take a look at what are the gaps, what's worked, what hasn't worked in the past, uh, are there some challenges that are going on? So just within the confines and boundary of risk assessment, we talked about fire dynamics within our changing built environment and, and what we should be doing, although we sort of got into a variety of different things. My, my word of, of uh, comments, again, is just take a look at where you're at, take a look at how you're doing your, your evaluations, and then match those things up and identify some gaps, some more areas for improvement. And I think the the other clear item that really you hit it on the head, uh, take advantage of some table top conversations, whether it be some building reads, curbside the conversations, or something as informal as just sitting around the kitchen table talking about a particular building, whether it be commercial or hybrid or residential, whatever, Main Street or something in the middle of nowhere, uh, just talking about what you're going to do what are the challenges regarding that operation as you are talking about the size up and, and the conditions that you're encountering? That That is going to pay itself forward with, with tremendous benefits when uh, you're confronted with something similar down the road. Well, Chris, you know, um, I, I saw a couple of things this morning, started making some analogies. Uh, I saw that we were seven weeks from Christmas, uh, the little – Um, cartoon was, you know, we need to start decorating, but I want to make an analogy of this. We're five months from FDIC. (laughs) So are you preparing? Are you ready to be there? Uh, If you've not planned on going, we want you to plan on going. We want to see you at FDIC. Uh, We're both going to be at FDIC this year and uh, looking forward to being back and at, uh, what I call the Super Bowl of, of conferences for the fire, an opportunity to charge your batteries. Uh, I'll be back uh, talking about uh, developing your, your next generation of fire service leaders, uh, diving deeper down into the professional development world and, and some of the things that are, that are dynamically changing there. Of course, you're back with uh, a, a dynamic program. You want to talk about it? Yeah, we're going to do a uh, program, and actually, it's going to tie right into what we're talking about. It's going to be a building facts, first arriving, construction tactics, and safety, talking about size up, talking about some different modeling 
uh, looking at tactical windows in particular. It's going to be a pre-con, so we've got four hours to really delve into some details. Um, really looking forward to our um, conversations that we'll have. We'll do uh, we'll more than likely be scheduled to do a live uh, pod and webcast there from the uh, Four Corners, as we did uh, this past year. So looking forward to that opportunity and uh, seeing how we're going to develop that as such. So a lot of things coming up. Uh, I'll say this, too. Uh, on my next episode here on uh, fire engineering on our uh, pod webcast, uh, we're going to be talking about the commercial fire ground. So I alluded to that in our last episode. I don't have any programs coming up here during this month of November, but our next scheduled program uh, that's scheduled for the early part of December, uh, we will have a conversation with a couple of uh, additional guests talking about the commercial fire ground as we uh, started talking a little bit about that in terms of the hybrids and the unique differences regarding construction tactics and especially tactical windows. So that'll be coming up uh, next month in December on our uh, scheduled uh, night. Well, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that, Chris, as, as we always do. Um, it's always good to, to have you on the show. It's always good to be together. Uh, looking forward to when we can catch up again and, and, you know, be out on the road at a conference. I know you were just out and about recently. And, you know, one of the things that, that I'm really excited about is, is FDIC. I just, I just can't wait to get there. If you really want to know the truth, I I was looking at it today. I was, you know, kind of thinking, you know, wow, we're, we're really closing in on this and, and the hype is starting and, if you've never been to FDIC, you definitely want to take the opportunity to get there. It, it's a phenomenal event. Your batteries are going to be recharged. You're going to learn so much from the classrooms, from the hallways, from, from the get-togethers. And, and I'm going to tell you, the, the best of the best are there sharing their knowledge freely. Uh, take advantage of that. And always take advantage of going by the fire engineering books and videos and picking up, you know, uh, a resource that you can put into your library. Uh, that's always something that is there. There's there's a lot of new books that are on the way. Yeah, a lot of a new lot ones of that have already hit the uh, shelves are available, uh, again, to order. A lot of great books. Uh, again, uh, take a look at uh, those offerings. Um, as the new upcoming, um, again, I know that some milestones were just, uh, uh, from a scheduling standpoint, I think our listeners uh, can expect some uh information coming about fairly quickly here with uh, the uh, promotional uh, video clips for each of the classes. Uh, There'll be some uh, upcoming uh, promotional information coming about that'll be published fairly soon here on the programs and the workshops, the the pre-cons, the hands-on. There's some really exceptional opportunities that uh, FDIC is looking to help make the cost more affordable with some incentives and some packages. So take a look at what's occurring. Go online to FDIC, go to the webpage, and uh, keep abreast of the latest insights on what's going to be offered and uh, prepare. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the streets, see you in the hallway, or see you in the classroom there in 2024. I'm looking forward to it also. Uh, my next show coming up will be December the 6th. Uh, And that's when we'll have another edition of Fire and Training. Chris, as always, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to have dynamic conversation and, and, you know, discuss, you know, the fire ground and and all the things we get the opportunity to discuss. So here, Doug, I'm just, uh, so again, being as fluid as we are, so I just took a look at my schedule here. So my program is on uh, December 7th. So I think we're going to chat a little bit about uh, maybe a two-parter, uh, some conversations that may start on your program, and then we will pick that conversation up uh, on my uh, program the following night. So uh, we'll, we'll see if that works out, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But sometimes, uh, again, these uh, these things that we do with our multiple-part series uh, end up being pretty cool. So uh, we'll see what we can do. I think that would be a great Christmas present there we go. for our listeners. <laughs> so let's just plan on doing that. Oh, that sounds like more, a, so. a great opportunity. Here's a little tidbit and, for everybody. And I, I'm just I'm just honored to, to have the opportunity to share with folks. And that's what fire and training is dedicated to. It's the men and women 
that are out in the streets 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, um, to give them the best knowledge, the best opportunity to be successful that we can. And both of us being advocates of everyone goes home, uh, we're, we're dedicated to making sure that that is actually the case, that everyone does go home and that we're, we're reducing injuries, we're reducing a lot of duty deaths, and we're actually developing and influencing the next generation. So that the next time we get together, December the 6th, December and the 7th, when we'll tag team taking it to the streets and fire and training together, uh, we'll see you around. As Chris said, uh, stay safe. We'll see you soon. The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes as a company is about its customers. As the holiday season has quickly approached, Explore a wide selection of unique and practical gifts at the Fire Store's Gift Center. Find the perfect presence for firefighters, EMTs, and first responders today. The Fire Store's goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit thefirestore.com for everything but the truck and shop its family of brands including Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more.